But to those who don't want to do that, those who do not feel overly constricted by their lifestyle, by the colonial English lifestyle, the wilderness will be a scary place. Now, all these things are also true in the colony in Jamestown, just not to the same extremes because the extremely religious nature of the colonists who initially peopled New England adds a slight twist to it. But uh, the interactions of both these colonies with the native people and with the, uh, uh, well, with the wilderness is going to set the tone for the next generation and the generation after that as progressively they continue to move further west. So the very word wilderness has wild in it. And this makes, well, this makes a wilderness an uncontrolled, uh, chaotic place, not like the Garden of, of Eden there in the Bible, which was paradise. And it wasn't like a vegetable garden. It was kind of like, you know, think of the hanging gardens of Babylon. It was like a park. It was like a place that was controlled by human hands and shaped, you know, when they were cast out of the Garden of Eden there in Genesis, where, where were they cast to? The wilderness. Why was that scary? Because it was, well, it was wild and uncontrolled, and it was going to take hard work to people that area, which was the command in Genesis that God gave them. So, wilderness, usually we think of forest, but uh, it could also be a desert and in the, uh, the, the thinking of, well, even in the language of the early 17th century, desert, whereas we think of it as a sandy place or a rocky place, could also just be any place that was a wilderness. That's why Bradford looked upon the vast autumnal forests of New England and said, uh, holy smoke, what a desert. So it was, uh, it was a fearful place. It was a bewildering place. And if you break that word down, it's got the word wild in it. To be bewildered means to be confused. Um, but early on, it meant to be lost as though you had been lured into the forests and therefore lost your way. So think about all those um, fairy tales and nursery rhymes and so forth from the old country from England, like the story of Little Red Riding Hood, you know, you're safe as long as you don't leave the road and go into the woods. So the goal of Puritans was to transform that wilderness bit by bit, uh, to control it, to end the chaos that was out there, and that includes the Indians that they viewed as chaotic beings and ultimately devil-worshipping chaotic beings, and transform that into a garden with quotation marks, although maybe not with quotation marks because they're wanting to turn it into farms, right? Uh, and the Indians that were out there in the wild they were part of that environment that needed to be transformed, ultimately transformed either by converting them to Christianity and to living like English people or to just getting rid of them. So, to the pilgrims, progress. Progress is good, and progress means taming nature more and more every day. That's what progress was to them. Um, and properly utilizing your resources, property, properly utilizing your time, right? Idle hands are the devil's workshop. So you've got to be busy, you've got to be industrious, and you've got to be using things, including the land around you. And just having a bunch of trees there, they regard it as pretty useless unless you cut them down and sold them as timber, which is immediately what they started doing. Now, it's also important to note that during this process, both in New England and in Jamestown, which later became the larger colony of Virginia, and then the other colonies that started to pop up, those colonists wanted to preserve their English identity. They felt 
they felt kind of uh, looked down upon, especially as the generations went by and you would have people who were born in these colonies that maybe had never even been to England. And they felt like people back in England looked down on them as though they weren't really English. And they wanted to emphasize, yes, we are, we're really English. But at the same time, they wanted to establish that they had another identity too. Um, not necessarily a colonial identity, because that kind of implies subjugation, but an American identity, because they were sharing in a unique set of circumstances that people back in England couldn't understand. Even people in other English colonies around the world couldn't necessarily understand. So there's some conflict within themselves, um, even as there's that conflict within themselves where just like they're trying to control nature, they're also trying to control their own human nature. And all this, all this may sound like, uh, you know, just sort of a meandering side trip when we're talking about westward expansion, but all those elements are going to go into creating the colonial and later the American character, basically. Um, and they're going to uh, they're going to start showing through as the descendants of those colonists move further to the west. So, uh, kind of a uh, um, summation: the English colonists, both north and south, wanted to maintain order and stability, and that meant. Staying out of the woods unless you had something specific that you were doing there that was productive, like killing things. So if there's somebody that just likes to leave the village and go wandering around in the woods, there's something wrong with that person. Uh, probably they're possessed by Satan, especially uh, in New England. That's how they would have looked at it. Um, Definitely don't hang out with the, the native people. Don't hang out with Indians like Thomas Morton did with, quote, savages whose uh, uncivilized ways will rub off on you. So there were, in both uh, New England and Virginia, strict laws passed against living among the Indians. You could be punished. You could actually be subjected to uh, hard labor imprisoned and forced to do hard labor if you went off and lived with the Indians. Uh, why is that? Well, they needed your labor there in the colony is the main reason. And, you know, if you run off, then everybody else will too, and they won't be able to be productive. There were especially strict laws against marrying or just having children with those native people because that was a, uh, well, ugly words. Uh, miscegenation um, is only an ugly word if you know what it means, which most people don't. don't. Um, quote, mongrelization or, quote, bastardization, those are ugly words. The, uh, uh, essentially, the weakening of the racial line was viewed very, very seriously by English colonists, much more so than it was by Spanish and French colonists, who were a lot more open to the idea and a lot more likely to intermarry with the native peoples, and who were much more likely to give citizenship to the children of those unions, which uh, is something that the English didn't really want to do at all. So that's something uh, that's kind of unique to the English among colonists. So here's, here's something to, to bear in mind. All the European colonists were bad news for the native people, all of them. The English, though, they want your land, and they don't want any weakening of their own racial lines, and they want you to either live like them or not live at all. Uh, so all those things spell some serious trouble between the native people and the English colonists in particular. Now, you may ask yourself, why would they have all these laws about living with Indians? Uh, and clearly it's because people were doing it. Uh, why did they make these laws so strict? Because people kept doing it. Why would people do it? Well, 
stop and think for a second. Who would you rather live with, Puritans or Indians? Uh, that pretty well sums it up right there. A lot more freedom living among the native peoples than you would have as an English colonist, especially in those Puritan colonies. And it was, it was frequently true, frequently true that people, uh, even people who were captured by, by Indians and then adopted into the tribe and made uh, members, full members of the tribe and treated as members of the tribe, almost never wanted to go back to English society. Not because they were ashamed necessarily, but because they liked that society better. Benjamin Franklin commented on that. He commented on how strange it was that, uh, that English colonists captured by Indians and uh, kind of uh, fit into their culture never wanted to come back, whereas Indians who were captured by English colonists and tried to force to, be, uh, to live according to their culture almost always tried to run away. So, you know, that kind of tells you something right there. In a much larger, more global sense, however, there was, a, there was a dichotomy, there was a paradox in how Europeans looked at native peoples, okay? So there were one of two stereotypes which would persist and continue to persist really even today. Those native people, instead of being looked at as sort of autonomous and distinct human individuals with uh, their own uh, agendas and with their own agency, they tended to be looked at in one of these two extremes, either as noble savages or as red devils. So they were either romanticized or they were demonized. Now the romanticized version uh, essentially is the view that Native American peoples were uh, completely innocent, like Adam and Eve in the garden, that they had been <clears throat> uncorrupted by civilization, that they were much closer to what human, humans were supposed to be, and therefore much closer not only to nature but to the essence of God and that they were something to be really, really held up and celebrated and imitated, but, you know, again, without recognizing their distinct humanity. Um, this tended to be the viewpoint of philosophers and poets who were living back in Europe. Uh, and then the other, the, the other stereotype, on the complete other end of the spectrum, they were just absolutely evil, demonic, red savages intent on nothing but destruction of innocent white people in the most violent and cruel of ways so that they were always the faceless bad guy. Now, you see both these things in Hollywood. Um particularly up until the late 1960s, early 70s, in which, in almost all cases, Native Americans were portrayed as these kind of anonymous, faceless figures, a large horde of cruel barbarians coming to kill everybody unless the cavalry can save them. Or, and this became, this, this was true from the beginning of movies from, you know, the 19-teens, there was an element of this, but it became the norm by the 1970s. The complete opposite, that they were presented as being far superior to the uh, European colonists or to the white Americans later on, that they had almost mystical powers in their closeness to the, uh, the balance of the universe and to nature, to the extent that there too they weren't really being presented as fallible and human. But those things got their start. They got their start in, in English society in the 1500s, particularly by the 1600s. And really, which one of these extremes a European kind of held to depended on, 
proximity. I like to say proximity in space and time. And what that means is if you are living far away from the Indians and therefore are not personally competing with them for resources, uh, you were, as a white person, much more likely to romanticize them. Whereas if you lived right next door to them, you were in competition, particularly over land, because you wanted their land, uh, and therefore they were othered in a negative way. Uh, they were viewed as just irredeemable barbarians. However, that's that's uh, space. What about prox? Uh, that's that's proximity. But what about uh, that is proximity in space. What about proximity in time? Essentially, uh, I'll use New England as an example. Once almost all the native peoples had been eradicated in New England uh, or absorbed into the greater population, with only a few small holdouts left, th they were no longer dangerous. They were no longer competitors. And once that happened, then the people of New England began to romanticize the Indians of that that area when, you know, their grandparents had hated them and viewed them as little better than animals. Same thing in the South. Uh, much later on, uh, the Trail of Tears, the lead up to that, the Cherokees were described as just being like animals, just irredeemable, and they were forcibly removed so that the people could get their land. And once that happened and they were mostly gone, all of a sudden they tended to be romanticized in the South. And all of a sudden, everyone had a Cherokee grandmother that no one had ever mentioned before. So um, that basic that basic split, um, like I say, has, has continued. It will continue all through our discussions here, and we'll talk about it in various different forms and contexts. Well, uh, we talked quite a bit about the demonizing. Let's talk a little more about the romanticizing. Now, the word savage is from the Latin sylvaticus, which comes from the root word silva, which means forest, and sylvan means pertaining to the forest. I mentioned earlier that as time went on, those colonists who felt restricted by the kind of uh, harsh rules of colonial England would look longingly into the woods as a place that they could go not only to better themselves and maybe gain land, but also to exercise more independence, more freedom. And in many cases, living among the Indians was an opportunity to do that. Now, that was not a new idea to English culture. There had long been a tradition, and this tradition went back to those, quote, pagan times before the establishment of Christianity, uh, when they had things like, you know, the maypole for uh, um, those spring fertility ceremonies, for instance. But there was this tradition uh, for the, uh, the midwinter celebration that later would coincide with the Christian holiday of Christmas of having the Lord of Misrule. So this was being done back in England, <clears throat> even at the time of the Puritans, although, of course, the Puritans would not have participated, not liking Christmas, period. So <clears throat> the, the Lord of Misrule in each village was a person that was appointed to be kind of like a clown, kind of a sacred clown, uh, who was to lead the revelry uh, and... Frequently he was dressed in green, frequently he was associated with the forest, just like the Greek god Pan, the god of, uh, well, um, Pan and also uh, uh, Bacchus and those other gods that are sort of associated with partying, revelry, and drunkenness, frequently were also associated with the forest, because a forest is a place that is chaotic. In, in English culture. So the Lord of Misrule would lead the Christmas partying. Um, so think not of the uh, Christmas pageant at your church, but think of some of the, the wild Christmas office parties that you may have heard about in 
popular culture. So leading the, the partying and dancing and profanity and uh, drunkenness was the lord of misrule. And there was also uh, the imagery of Robin Hood, which was set in the uh, 12th and 13th century during the Crusades. The idea there being that Robin Hood was uh, a member of the Anglo-Saxon nobility who were being oppressed by the Norman conquerors and that, uh, uh, that he led a merry band of bandits in Sherwood Forest who lived a life of independence, sort of uh, thumbing their noses at the Norman English authority. And you can draw a line from Robin Hood to Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett and to the hero of the Leather Stocking Tales, which started being published in 1821, Hawkeye. Think of the last of the Mohicans. The, uh, the, the colonist, the English settler, who is now, by choice, living out there right next to the Indians in some cases, or with the Indians in others, living in a Native American-like way, even dressing like the Native Americans. And all of this was connected to a desire for independence, uh, for freedom, and for escape from the austere control of colonial authority. Now, as time went on in both the northern colonies and the southern colonies, and by, you know, by the late 1600s, there were other colonies besides just Plymouth and uh, Jamestown. As time went on, the closer that you worked to the wilderness, the wilder you were considered. It was believed that being out in the forest a lot has an effect on you, a negative effect in making you less civilized. We're talking about lumberjacks. We're talking about uh, trappers um, and hunters uh, and scouts. Those people uh, living in the backwoods, not living in the main communities, in the main farms, uh, but out there in the back country, were believed to be, you know, rougher than the people living in the more established eastern communities because they were out there on the frontier. They were out there on the fringes of society and civilization. And they were viewed, they were looked down on, they were viewed by the people back farther east as becoming more like Native Americans and becoming even more like the animals they were hunting and eating, which is to say, uncontrollable, even by themselves, viewed as people with no self-control and as being immoral because they had no sense of conformity, no sense of decency to the established rule of things, because they're out there in the woods doing whatever they want. Now, that may have actually been true of some individuals. It may not have been. But that's how they were viewed. And uh, if you think about that down through American history, that would continue to hold true as well. All right. Well, now I just want to take a look, if we're talking about English interaction with the local native peoples, at some words. Words that the English colonists picked up from their Native American neighbors in the 1600s. Now, up in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, the colonists were dealing with the Narragansetts and with the Wampanoag, primarily. Down in uh, Jamestown, they were dealing with the Powhatan. All those tribes speak Algonquin languages. Their languages were closely related. So words were very similar. So these are some words that were picked up as being, quote, the Indian words for things, like tomahawk, meaning axe, or hatchet, rather, coming from the Powhatan. Uh, papoose, meaning child. Wigwam, uh, 
uh, meaning a dwelling. Um, wampum, which was uh, strung together shell beads that could be used as money or could be used as documentation of treaties and agreements and stuff like that. And then this word, squaw, which uh, may have come from the Mohawk word ojisqua, um, meaning, well, slit, uh, referring to a woman in the crudest of terms, referring to a woman by her sex organs. Uh, that is why this word is considered very offensive by Native American women. Uh, because it objectifies and dehumanizes them. Um, so don't use this word. This is one of the words that you should just not use. Maybe you've heard the word before. Increasingly, I have students, now that no one watches old westerns anymore, that have never even heard some of these words. Um, but but don't, use, don't use this one. You know what you could say instead? Woman. Anyway, point is, these words that kind of became accepted by the English as, quote, the Indian word for stuff, made their way into English and made their way even as, as uh, foreign words, words that were part of the English lexicon. And uh, oddly enough, as the English colonists, who later were American citizens, not they, but their descendants, moved further west, they took these words with them because, well, this is kind of, kind of an, uh, uh, an American trait. You assume what a, uh, applies to one non-white group of people applies to all of them. So a lot of the uh, white folks used these words in talking to the Indians out on the Great Plains, out in South Dakota, uh, thinking they'd know what they were talking about because, hey, these are the Indian words. It wasn't their words, though. Uh, a lot of times if you read documents and accounts from that time period, you hear some of those Plains Indians using these words, but it's more likely that they thought these were the English words because that's what the Americans were saying, right? Uh, rather than their own language uh, words for these items. So that's just one more example of sort of broadly overgeneralizing, generalizing uh, group of people, which was something that was frequently done. All right, well, we've set things up for the colonists arriving in the New World. Now, going to spend some time, quite a bit of time, talking about the culture of the people who were already there, which was radically different in many ways. Now, a lot of this stuff applies to the eastern woodland Indians that are the ones the English colonists first encountered. Encountered, made alliances with, fought against, essentially, for almost 200 years. Uh, but many of these cultural traits will also apply to tribes farther west on the Great Plains uh, and even beyond that. Because some of these, uh, some of these cultural traits are almost universal. So... That's where we're going now. The links that I, I post after this video, the next five, will take you to um, lectures one through five of my basic U.S. history course, uh, the first half of U.S. history, in which I go into great detail about Native American Indian culture. And I'm, I'm doing that because that basic lecture, it's basically about a three hour uh, lecture altogether, one week's worth of lectures, is something that is kind of groundwork, it's kind of foundational for understanding US history, expansion into the uh, American West. It also shows up in all my American Indian studies uh, courses, my environmental history course. So don't don't be fooled. Uh, don't think you've gone to the wrong thing when you follow the link and it says U.S. History number one or whatever. Okay, so very uh, uh, very important set of set of lectures. Some of it stuff you know, and some of it stuff probably that you didn't. 
that is going to be really important to understanding what happens from this point forward in the course where Native Americans are concerned.